Hi, I'm Dr. Kalanyak at iHuman Patients by Kaplan. And today we're going to try to diagnose Mark Webb. Does he have influenza? Does he have COVID-19? Lots of people in the audience are complaining about upper respiratory type symptoms. So what do we do? With me to help diagnose Mark is a whole group of students from across the country. And they're all gonna come on screen so that you can see them. And I'm gonna play Vanna White for them. And they're going to tell me what to do so we can diagnose this patient. Before we start, let me tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a trained internist, endocrinologist, and nuclear physician. I've had double digit numbers of years on faculty at UCSF and Stanford before joining iHuman Patients where we're using simulation to help students understand how to approach patients and how to diagnose them. This will be an interactive live stream. So the students are gonna be asking lots of questions and telling me what to do, and you in the audience can do the same. So use your chat, tell us what you want to do, but let me start by setting up the scenario. It is the pandemic. You are coming in as a retired physician and you are going to help have to help in the clinic. In the clinic, you see it is packed full of patients. And you are told that you have to decide which patients in your clinic room have just upper respiratory infections or other types of things versus COVID because you only have 25 COVID test kits. So that's the task at hand. And Mark Webb is your first patient. You are handed his chart because you're new to the clinic. You don't know any of the patients. And we're asked, okay, try to diagnose Mark. Does he get one of those rare COVID kits or not? So let's get started. His chief complaint, fatigue and cough. Now it's in your hands as medical students. What do you wanna do at this point in time? So here we are, you've received his chart. What do you guys wanna do? What brought you into clinic today, Mr. Webb? All right, are you gonna look at this chart or not? Yeah, we, we are. We got the chart, we looked at it. Yeah, I think we'd probably wanna look at it to see what we've got going on. So I'm gonna take notes over here on your key findings. You're gonna tell me what to write there. What should I do? Anything in particular jumping out at you? Okay, so his temperature is a little high, 100.0. Not quite a fever. Um, heart rate 80, blood pressure is within normal limits. Respiratory rate is a little high at 26 and his O2 sat is 94% on room air. Okay. Do we wanna look at last time he was seen in the clinic? Yes. Absolutely. Or is that a recent like ER visit or something like that? Yeah. So he was seen two years, eight months ago, pre-college physical. Tell me if you see anything I should write. I'm just History curious. of childhood asthma. asthma. Okay. He got the flu vaccine. Okay. He got the flu vaccine. Seems to be pretty aware of his health in general, doing things to prevent unnecessary injury. Excellent. Should we look at medications? Has he been taking that? Because he said it's like he's weaning off the asthma meds. A good question to ask. Let's keep that in mind. Right. Anything in the family? He doesn't smoke. Okay. He lives smoke. at home, so he could have had exposure if someone else was sick. All right. Keep all those questions in mind for the history. We'll just go through anything in the physical exam jumping out at you. We need to note. Clear to auscultation bilaterally. Okay, so he had a few wheezes way back when. That's three years ago. Management plan. All right, so we looked at his chart. We pulled out the things that we think might be worrisome. This flu immunization though, that was three years ago, right? Do we wanna keep it on the list? 
No. no. Yeah. Okay. So you have to remember what you're reading. If it was within two or three weeks, yeah, absolutely. Three years ago, it's not going to help. So the first question was, how can I help you today? I heard that right at the beginning. So let's ask. You can see that that is listed as a good question. It gives us some idea of what's going on. He's feeling really exhausted, so we have the fatigue. We've got muscle aches and a dry cough. What, would, what do you want me to write down? When did it start? Sorry? When did the symptoms start? When did his what start? When did his symptoms start? Uh, what symptom do you want to talk about? His dry cough. Okay. Do we want to write down anything else on the key finding list? I think also muscle aches. Okay. Add body aches to that. Do we want to go into characterizing each of the symptoms or do you want to make sure you have all of your symptoms out there? I think we can get the list of symptoms and then go through each one. Yeah, and so one of the things to think about when you're dealing with patients is that sometimes they don't tell you everything right at the get-go. And so sometimes you have to actually ask a second question just to make sure you've got it all because we were all told not to complain. So we want to make sure we are not complaining. So what he's telling you here is he is feeling short of breath. So when I see some lab value or vital signs that are off normal, one of the things you want to do is double check them, right? Does the patient have, you know, feel that? And we had hypoxia, you know, 94%, you would not feel as perky as you normally would expect. You might be a little short of breath. Does the patient feel that? So again, that might be another reason why you might prompt him to ask about additional symptoms or concerns. But now we do want to find out when that cough started. So I can type questions up here or I can use my category folder. So let's ask when the cough started by typing and see if that works. Ooh, my mouse is just not wanting to work here. I'm going to bounce to a, let's get him started here. And try to give it back. So when did your cough start? We're going to then, you can see my natural language processor, sort of like a Google search, brings up the best option. When did your cough start? Two days ago. Okay. What else do we want to know about his cough? Anything that makes it better or worse. Pardon? Anything that makes it better or worse. Okay. So let's go into cough. And you can see another way to find tons of different questions where you can scan down and find the question you're looking for is, um, does anything make it better or worse? Uh, so let's find that question. Let's see, do you, does your cough keep you from sleeping? Here, started seems to be, okay, your cough better or worse at any time of the day or year. You probably didn't want that. You just wanted it any time of the day. Has your cough changed over time? That's always an important one. Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? What else do we want to know about the cough? Is it productive or non-productive? Yeah, are you coughing up sputum? Great question. What does that tell you when you ask about sputum? It can lead you to think of it's more bacterial versus viral and different yeah. colored sputum gives you different clues as to what the cause can be. Right. And so if the patient were coughing up sputum, you'd want to know what does it look like, right? And all of those other characteristic questions. Um, we've asked about whether it's changed over time. Um, another thing you might want to think about with coughs is just pattern, you know? Is it at any particular time? So allergies can have a pattern, uh, sinus drainage, you know, that kind of thing. So you guys are right on top of it. Any other questions on cough or should we pick a different symptom? 
Have you taken anything for the cough? Okay, so let's just type that. Have you taken any treatments for your cough? So you can see that sometimes it's just giving you slightly different phrasing. So learning how to phrase things, you know, slightly differently, it just increases your repertoire on communicating with your patient. But no, he's not taking any particular medications. He's just coughing uh, and he even coughs for us. So what else do you wanna know? Should we continue to cough or should we work on something else? There was a question of, does your cough come from like your chest or your throat? Um, that might be good to clarify with him. Okay. Does your cough come from your throat, your chest? He doesn't quite know. It doesn't feel like sinus drainage. So he at least knows that it's not really helpful. We can continue along with the cough, but when I start seeing patients, one of the things I try to focus on are the things that are most life-threatening as the first thing. People don't typically die of a cough, but they can die of hyperhypothermia. And oxygenation is always really good to make sure we understand. So do you think we want to move to maybe his oxygen situation? Ask about the shortness of breath. Yeah, yeah probably. Um, so um, maybe when did you first start noticing? And he started it when he started feeling tired. So we could get into when the fatigue started, but do you want to continue characterizing his shortness of breath first? Is it worse when you're lying down or when you're standing up? Okay. Or rest versus an activity. Okay. So do you become short of breath with activity? It makes it worse. Okay. Did the shortness of breath come on suddenly or is it just come? Okay. Um, can't quite find it there. So um, how quickly does it come on? I'm not sure. He doesn't like quickly. He's not seeming to totally understand that problem. So let's see if we can rephrase it in a slightly different way. Like maybe what were the events surrounding the start of your shortness of breath? You know, if I was trying to catch peanuts in my mouth and then I sort of choked, maybe that could explain my shortness of breath. Uh, when he started feeling sick. So understanding the circumstances at the start of a symptom is always helpful. So that would suggest that this shortness of breath also started about two days ago when everything seemed to start at the same time. Um, we asked about exertion. Are you still short of breath at rest? Not as much, so definitely worse when you're moving around. Um, the question that you had as far as how suddenly it started, you were getting at, you know, potentially things like a pulmonary embolism where it starts very suddenly, uh, pneumothorax, which can start very suddenly, so great idea. Anything else we want? We could also, for severity and shortness of breath, if it awakens you at night, then it's pretty severe. So that might be where your old carts and that S comes in. Any other questions on his shortness of breath that we want to cover? Is the shortness of breath similar to your previous asthma attacks or is it different? Does he get short of breath with his asthma attacks? So asthma can sometimes, people can describe it not as shortness of breath, but as difficulty breathing. Is that going to help us? Or do we want to move to a different, you know, trying to understand other things here? He's got a fever. He's got the fatigue. I think along Mario's lines, like generally, if he's felt this way before, like these similar symptoms before. So. Okay. Also, has he taken anything for the shortness of breath? Like they had mentioned that he was on a medication for asthma, but maybe not on it anymore. Okay, so maybe we want to really find out what medications he is taking so that we have that and put that in perspective, not only for his asthma, but also for his um, temperature. So maybe we want to say, um, 
Should we go first for the temperature and the fever over the counter stuff? Is he taking anything over the counter? Um, so he took Ibu yesterday. That can be really critical because what we want to know with that one is if he took it, you know, like an hour or two before he came in, that temperature of 100 might not be without medication on board and it might be higher. So we get a sense of severity. Um, are you taking medications from others that he might be you know, taking? Are you taking your prescription medications? He's taking his inhaler you know, that he had prescribed. Um, anything else you want on that? So along the lines of the inhaler, when was the last time he had to use it? Okay. Oops. When did you last? He used his inhaler this morning. So we've got that. So can summarize, someone just summarize what do we know about this patient so far? Anybody? So it sounds like uh, about two days ago, he started feeling um, sick. He's feeling some muscle aches, um, shortness of breath, and he's noticed a dry cough. And he's also had a mild fever. Um, he tried taking ibuprofen, which didn't really help. Um, and he's been using his inhaler. Okay, great summary. Great start to what you might write for your problem statement. So good job. What else do we need to know from this gentleman? Is he having any chest pain? Okay, we could ask. What his maximum temperature was? Um, how high has it gotten? He doesn't have any chest pain. We could ask how high is your fever? Like if you've ever measured your fever, because I mean, if you just ask. How high is your fever? He has no idea. He wasn't taking his temperature. So you were right on. You first have to determine whether they're measuring it before you ask him how high. So good catch. Has he had um, any contacts? Yeah. So we, we do want to move quickly through it. We're in a really busy clinic. Remember, we have all of those things happening there that we have to take into consideration. So we want to determine clinic. Let's get a list of questions we want to ask so that we can go quickly through them. So we want to know contacts travel because that puts them at increased risk. So we want to know contacts, travel, what else? We work in a healthcare setting or any or immunization. that could cause them to have Environment, absolutely. We want to move to environment, understand the environmental uh, constructs there. So let's go into, um, I think it's does he smoke or use any drugs okay. and has he been in contact with anyone who has traveled um if he hasn't traveled himself so let's find out we'll start with the travel first because that was on the list have you recently traveled so he just recently returned from italy seven days abroad um do we want to list that down yes Now that we know that travel history, what's the next most important question that we want to know from this gentleman like now? Were there sick contact? Were you around sick people? That might help um, give us background in history, which is absolutely important. What else Where though? Been, um, since you got back to the US, like yeah. who have you So I traveled, I came back. Where are you staying now? so that I can understand that and know who I have potentially at risk because I have a little concern on what's going on. Italy and that shortness of breath, the myalgias, that low grade fever starting to sound, you know, a little worrisome. So, so where are you living now, right? So where do you live? He was in the dorms. Is that what I wanted to know? No, that's not exactly what I wanted to know. Um, who is living with you, right? All right, that's really what I know because I want to know, you know, 
what, who is at risk. So I have to put down that at risk, I have parents and sister at home. At and what point I would ask him, um, has his parents or sister had any symptoms similar to his? Okay, so we're going to get at symptoms. Does anybody else have symptoms? No, so that's good to know. We Maybe saw also when, um, when I'm, sorry. Got back. I'm sorry? Maybe like when exactly he got back because people on his flight might have been exposed to him. Um, okay. while so he was potentially for the CDC, in order to allow the tracking, we'd probably want to know what flight and start gathering all that information. But because we're, we have a limited amount of time, one hour to show what we're going to do here, I'm going to move us a little bit forward. I am going to show that your faculty, if they wanted to give you some hints along the way, these are what questions we've gotten right so far. So you can see at the top, I've been keeping track. We were giving 80 questions, which is really an abundant number to interview a patient. We've used 27. We said we've gotten 14 that were really key and there are still others remaining. So you can see how that might help encourage you to keep looking for questions that might be important, but we don't have enough time to go into that in great depths, but you guys are doing a great job. We're gonna move forward and get our feedback. So right now, our history taking score, if I was really playing it for real, would be locked in as soon as I say yes. And now it's going to show me what kinds of questions I should have asked, where it fits in the whole organizational scheme, if we're using a structured approach, what that question is, and what the patient's response is. So this is one way we could do it. Another way we could do it is we could just list the questions that you missed and you would have to go back and ask them. But we're going to assume that, you know, we would do a little bit better job if we were working it independently. So we're going to move forward to the physical exam. So you can see in the physical exam, he gets undressed and now we get to make the same thing as we did in the history hundreds of micro decisions to decide what we're going to examine in him. If I needed to do vital signs, I could do vital signs. I'll show you, I could just do that. And that's how we would take a pulse. And notice there's a clock above his head. But if I look in his chart, and again, look at the current visit, we have the vitals. So I probably am not going to repeat them. I'm going to assume the clinic was stellar in their ability to get them for me. So at this point, what do I want to do? Heart and lungs. Heart and lungs? Is general that appearance. How is he looking? Is he in distress? Okay, so we could look at general appearance. Um, does he look in distress? Because we can see him. I can unmute him. We can actually watch his chest <coughs> rise and fall. We can hear his coughing. It's that nice dry cough that we heard. Um, we would continue to add things. Do we want to start a differential before we get into our physical exam? Does somebody want to just start tossing up things or should we wait till later? We can have a general idea right now so that we can tailor our exam. Okay. So what would you like to do? Um, corona or COVID-19. <laughs> Upper <laughs> respiratory infections in general. Okay, so we're gonna say COVID is one. We're gonna say uh, upper respiratory infection. And that's, Influenza. I'm sorry? Influenza. Influenza. Let's do that. Acute asthma exacerbation. Okay, can do that. Bacterial pneumonia as a must not miss. All right. You guys are on top of it. Did we say allergic? Um, rhinitis or sinus infections or anything? We have not. So which of the pneumonia, I'm sorry, which of the pneumonias do you want? Uh, probably bacterial since he seems healthy and not immunocompromised or in the hospital. Okay. Can we put viral in there also just because he's not having any sputum production? I don't remember that exactly actually. Anybody want to vote for community acquired? Community acquired. Yes. <laughs> Plasmal pneumonia, so like walking pneumonia. That would be more in your viral 
or we could put it as an atypical if you wanted. This is very atypical, so probably not, not an aspiration. Fungal, too short a time period. He's not hospitalized, PCP, PJP. We really didn't get enough of a history on his you know, sexual practices. We didn't get enough of a history on his uh, IV drug use or anything to know whether he has any immunocompromised, we'll assume not. How about, um, and we wanted allergic, right? Yeah. I did, have, on I did have a question. Um, in the real setting, if we did see a COVID patient and after the history, we, we, we were highly suspicious of it, would, would we, at that point before touching him, like wear PPEs before doing a physical exam in the real scenario or? I think if you think that you are at, at risk, your first job is to protect yourself as a healthcare provider. And if you thought that your patient was COVID positive, and you only had one, do you put it on yourself or do you put it on the patient to keep the patient from spreading things? Patient. Keep patient, so put it on the patient because that's the source of where the aerosolization is coming from. Hopefully you've got more than one mask, you've got two masks, and if you really were concerned and I was going to do sampling for taking a specimen, then I definitely want to have myself protected as much as possible. And we've seen that on the news with the people in the cars coming through and getting tested. They're in complete garb while they're getting the testing. So obviously, but patient first so they don't spread it and then yourself as quickly as possible. Um, you probably have already had gloves on if you thought you were in that risk. So let's go through and just rank these. What's our leading diagnosis? Do we want to go to hands or just call it out? What's number one? COVID-19. COVID. Okay. So we're going to say COVID. We're going to put all the rest as alternative, which is great. Must not miss. What's my must not miss diagnosis here? And what's my definition of a must not miss? I think you could argue that COVID is a must not miss just because you could spread it, but also the bacterial pneumonia is a must not miss. I agree. And I agree on both fronts. That's a really good thought. COVID, you're not only concerned about a small percentage of individuals going on and getting rapidly sick and requiring ventilation and ICU beds, but you are trying to minimize the spread of a pandemic. And that makes him a must not miss, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in that you wanna limit the exposure of others. So we're gonna go back to doing our physical exam now that we've thought through the differential and we can select what we wanna do and what order we want to do it in. So tell me what you want to do, starting at the top of the head and we'll work our way down. Uh, check his skin for maybe cyanosis. So that would be like a big sign of- Right. So a lot of people forget to check the skin. You're checking for rash, for lesions, for skin turgor, how dehydrated, how well you know he is overall. What's our next thing? We got all the vitals, right? We have the vitals. We can double check them. So unless I feel I need to repeat anything, I probably don't want to take my valuable clinic time. My waiting room is packed. What am I going to do? Um, also, at you. Sorry, your nose and throat look for swelling. So we'll inspect the nose, no polyps, no discharge. Look up the nostrils, no polyps or discharge. We can look in his ears. What do you think, guys? Looks so, fine. Okay. Good light reflex, nothing that I'm seeing there. Um, anybody want to look in his mouth or pharynx? Yes. Okay. Looks good to you, looks bad. Do I need to do anything? It's normal. Do we want to look in his eyes? It won't hurt. It won't hurt. I'm going to look. Why? Because if we've read the literature in COVID, the conjunctival injection does appear to be one of the findings. It's in the 30% range, but still that's a third of the patients have it. So worth doing. Um, anything else? Do we want to move down or do other things in the head? 
I read that like um, a loss of your sense of smell has also apparently one of um, the symptoms that seems to be pretty specific. Yeah, we could ask that in the history. We could actually go back and ask that. However, it's now still considered a bit anecdotal. So if they don't have it, I would have to know, you know how to compare it to prior. Um, the other thing that can affect the sense of smell is some people that are using Zycam in the nostrils has been shown to diminish the sense of smell. So I'm not sure it's going to be my biggest payoff. And at this point in time with my waiting room packed, I wanna go for the biggest payoff in stuff, right? Because I need to get him isolated if he does have COVID. So what do I wanna do here? Lungs, heart and lungs. Yeah, I'm gonna though palpate the neck. Yeah. yeah, before I go down to the lungs. So for auscultation in our program, it's a simulation. It would be good if you put in earbuds or earphones, just like you put a stethoscope in your ears to hear heart and lungs better. Um, unfortunately, we can't do that. And unfortunately, we're going across a Zoom and a secondary you know, computer software program. So we're just gonna try it and I'm gonna ramp this up to the max and we'll see if you can hear anything in the lungs. And I know it's hard. We'll flip them. And normally I would be listening for multiple breaths at each location, but again, we're sort of pushed for time here. Yeah, that <laughs> I see somebody shaking their head. Oh, it doesn't sound all that good. All right, so left lung, what do we pick? Wheezing, right? Is that a wheezing sound? Yeah, we've got some expiratory wheezes there, and we sort of heard them bilaterally. So, do we want to listen to his heart? Yeah. Somebody had said that before, so. So these are the Proctor Harvey heart sounds. And I know you're not appreciating them anywhere close to the way you would if you had earbuds in. The cool thing. So the cool thing about the Proctor Harvey heart sounds they were recorded in each of those locations. You can still hear that the patient is breathing while you're listening to the cardiac sounds, which is really critical. So you get an authentic, uh, authentic view of what it's really like. What did we hear here? Sounds normal. Yeah, I think it's normal. Anything else you want to do? We can do continue to do more. Can we just check for his chest wall expansion? You could, you could check for chromatis, you could check for uh, visual inspection of an anterior and posterior and the movement and the symmetry, uh, which we've done. Um, does anybody wanna examine his abdomen? Yes, no, you can argue. Yeah. Yes. I know <laughs> some COVID patients have um, present with GI symptoms as well. Yeah, so maybe we want to auscultate. We would always auscultate before we palpate so we don't stimulate things. So we're going to auscultate his abdomen. Yeah, little nice bowel sounds, but we didn't ask him whether he had any problems with diarrhea. Maybe we should have. So we could go back and ask those questions now. For the sake of time, I'm going to keep us moving forward. But at that point, you would go back and ask, right? we might want to actually palpate the abdomen. And here you can see, whenever we can't palpate, we're going to tell you what you would feel. So does anything there make you concerned? No. So on my risk chart here, my key findings, we probably want to put those wheezes. The uh, conjunctival injection. All right, 
Should we go moving forward and see if we can finish the, okay, so there's my physical exam. I'm going to get, did I do my documentation right? Did I do my procedures right? We'll tell you. Did you then look at the vital signs? What did you do incorrect? And what did you miss? So we didn't miss anything. We probably didn't, we didn't finish auscultating the abdomen. That was me. I didn't finish it for you. So I could get a little red X so that you can see that my computer keeps track of everything for you. Um, so I had to throw a couple of little errors in there. You guys are way too good. Let's move on to developing an assessment. So here in the assessment, we have to decide what is the most significant active problem with this gentleman and how is everything else related to it? So while you're looking through that list, the reason we're doing that is we're trying to decide is this a single acute process two different acute processes, an acute process overlaying a chronic process. What's going on with all of those symptoms that we're looking at? So um, what do you think? Most significant active problem. The cough. Shortness of breath, the hypoxia. The hypoxemia. So don't forget that hypoxia. You know, people go downhill if they don't get enough oxygen. And then we'll see how it was related to everything. The fatigue. Do you think it's related, unrelated, unknown, or resolved? Related. 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 The dry cough. Related as well. Okay. What about that fever? Also related. Okay. What about the asthma? A potential complication factor, um, so it puts them at higher risk for complications. Okay, so, but is it related to his shortness of breath? Unknown. It's unknown, we don't know. It might be contributing, maybe he's not moving as much air in those areas that are wheezy. So maybe it is muscle aches. Related. related. Okay, travel to Italy. Related. Related. <laughs> I have risk parents and sister at home. Okay. So we're concerned. It's probably not related to his presentation, but it's putting him at risk. So I don't think I have a category for at risk. Maybe it's something I should add. Um, or maybe it doesn't really belong on his list of key findings. It's something that I would write on a notepad, which is probably how I would have handled it. Wheezes? Related. Related. All right. And that conjunctival injection? Related. 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 Could it be other things like pink eye or viral conjunctivitis? Uh, those are the questions we're getting from the audience. And the answer is it could be, but it also has been associated with COVID. And so do I want to give him two separate processes or is it more likely he has one process happening? One, okay. So that's the vote from our medical students here. Let's move on. So this is what we decided. This is what the author of the case um, felt as far as how we should have categorized things. And then the feedback here, I'm playing the case in learning mode. It's like having a preceptor in your pocket. So if you're doing this by yourself, you wouldn't have me guiding you through it or giving you my thoughts on the whole process. This is those thoughts. It's like you came out, you presented to your preceptor and there's trying to talk about how we would put things together without giving you a final diagnosis because we're going to ask you to write a problem statement. Now, we did ask uh, one of you to summarize the case and you did a great job. And if you remember, I said, that's really what you would see in a problem statement. So if I actually click on that problem statement, I would get to see what the author or the clinician who took care of this patient felt how they would summarize it. And if we've done a really good job on our problem statement, I could give this problem statement to a variety of clinicians and we'd all be in the same ballpark as far as what we think is happening and what our differential diagnoses are. So you can see we start with the identifying information, the key historical findings, the key physical findings, and the risk factors is the structure that can be used in a problem statement that this author has used. 
for the beginning student, and I don't know, we've got a variety of students at a variety of different levels that are helping to play the case, but if we were all beginners, one of the things your faculty might want you to do is to pause here and think about what body systems might be involved. If we're all senior students, we're probably not gonna even have to see this screen because we'll go straight to the differential. You guys have been doing so good. I'm assuming you're much more senior, even if you're not in the way you're approaching the patient. Maybe it's because you've been hearing so much about respiratory infections on the news. So we're gonna say it's probably respiratory and move forward to getting the feedback. So we were did that right. Ultimately, we have to figure out, do we wanna add anything to our differential? Do we wanna take anything off our differential before we submit it for grading? I'll do whatever you want. Definitely add like influenza, viral, like pneumonia. Um, yeah. I would think. You want all of this or do you want to remove those two? I was a little confused. Well, I don't know if we've taken an influenza test yet to rule out um, the flu. You were right. We have not. At this point in time, the question is, we have no laboratory data. So are we satisfied with this? Because sometimes when you do a physical exam, what you're thinking about during the history might change with your physical findings. You might find something, you wanna add another diagnosis, or you might say, eh, I really don't have enough to support, you know, X, Y, or Z. So if we're good, it sounds like most people are thumbs up. Give me yeah. a thumb. Yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> we're thumbs up. We're gonna go with what we've got on the list clinical feedback, and now I'm gonna find out what I did right. So coronavirus was right. Upper respiratory infection, usually that's a viral infection, usually it's mild. So that hypoxia is probably why that's being pulled off. Um, pneumonia versus viral pneumonia versus community acquired pneumonia. Um, most frequently, this is probably, um, there are pros and cons for each of these. So in looking through it, you should be able to argue why certain ones might have been chosen. Living circumstances on where he was living, traveling, that kind of thing might have made him a little higher risk for a community acquired pneumonia. Uh, viral pneumonia, not a bad thought. Allergic rhinitis, we didn't have any of that crusty eye discharge. We didn't really find out anything about itching eyes. We didn't ask about his allergies, but three years ago, he said he didn't have any allergies at all. So maybe that's why the author felt that was not as important. Uh, ranking the diagnoses, do we wanna keep this as our ranking? This is what you did early on. We can keep it. Okay, and then now we're gonna go and get clinical feedback. And here's the discussion of what that feedback is. Asthma is a must not miss on top of things. It puts him at increased risk if he's not aerating certain areas. Uh, and so that might've been the author's thought process. Selecting tests. Ultimately, we now need to determine what are we going to order in order to rule in or rule out a diagnosis. So for coronavirus, what do you wanna get? The COVID yes. test. Okay. So, um, I was just pointing x ray just in general, but okay, we can. Um, so we're going to do a COVID test, maybe a chest CT also. We're going to move, we could let's the do a flu chest test CT. as well. But I'm sorry, the flu test while you're on that other slide, it had like flu test under it. So, okay, we'll do flu for influenza. Yep, okay. For that chest x-ray, where do you want it? Under corona. Chest and, um, I can see that CT is a lot better for COVID. Okay, so we have a divergence of opinion. Are we going, and I'll get both and we'll see what happens. What else, any other places that we want a chest x-ray? Chest x-ray goes under pneumonia. pneumonia as well. We'll put it there. 
And then we want to get a CT. So you can see this file folder system just makes it easier for me to find what I want to do. So I'm going to do, and we'll do a uh, chest CT and we'll put it under coronavirus. Anything else we want to order? Do you have a viral panel? What's a viral panel? I think it's just like a general screen for other common viruses. Okay, do we want to do that? Yeah. It is so one I, of the questions at our yeah. health district. So, so I mean, I, I have a question regarding that because in my, I was doing a rotation in a pretty rural area and tests are really limited. So what they were doing is running a influenza and viral panel. And if one of those are positive, they're like, oh, it's probably that and not Corona. But can't you technically have both we potentially? Can. Do we want to be cost effective or don't we want to be cost effective? So that's the kind of thing. Um, if we think, remember with this gentleman, we've got a waiting room. If we think that he's high on coronavirus, would we want to rule that out before we order the viral panel? Sure, since it's so prevalent now. Okay, so if we're thinking about being cost effective, the other thing that we want to think about is Radiation exposure, lifetime accumulation of radiation exposure. Maybe that's my nuclear medicine training, but we worry about that a lot. And so, you know, do we want both a chest CT or a chest X-ray? You guys have to decide which. Rarely would we get both. I would say the X-ray is just faster and like a quick yes or no. It's not as effective. Like see, the, the studies are showing that the CT is more sensitive for uh, COVID, okay. but it's also like a lot more time consuming. This patient has time positive time. travel history with okay. Italy, so we could probably say that do the COVID test first, and then if that's negative, do the uh, viral panel. Yeah, so there's a lot of discussion here. For the sake of time, I'm going to move us forward so we can see what we did right or wrong. Here again, so even though we're not- It takes a few days to come back, right? Right. So, we're going to, this is what they would suggest. The CBC for the community acquired pneumonia, you also see alterations in the, uh, sometimes a thrombocytopenia and a leukopenia. In the coronavirus, you also see some elevation in the transaminases, which is why they put those there. Reviewing test results, here's our influenza negative. We didn't get an FEV1 to see if his asthma was contributing to his hypoxia. Maybe it's a thought we should have thought about. Um, that looks normal. Chest X-ray here. It looks pretty normal to me. Again, we have a little bit of time. I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, and it is, by interpretation, normal. Here we're seeing a little bit of the elevated transaminases. Here we come back with his COVID test being positive and the CBC doesn't look all that out of the ordinary. So with that, we have to make a diagnosis. Is it a slam dunk? Okay, okay so. it would be unusual to have a false positive for COVID virus, but you do frequently get, or not frequently, you can get false negative tests. So if you thought you had a patient with influenza and the, you're deciding between COVID and influenza and both the coronavirus and the influenza were negative, you know, one could be a false negative. Um, so you still might have to make a clinical decision. We're going to submit this. We would then get our, you know, did we get it right or wrong? And then we've been ignoring these little gearhead guys, but throughout the case, we can put additional information or we can check your knowledge throughout the case. So in this particular case, I put in, what do we know about coronavirus versus SARS versus MERS and that whole thing? A little bit about you know, the pathophysiology. When people die, what do they find in the path specimens? You know, how do they die? So I thought that was important to add to the case. Ultimately, we have to give him a plan. So I'm going to just put in gibberish here so that we can move forward and leave some time for questions. We're going to get clinical feedback. And in this particular plan, he would still be considered to put in personal isolation, lots of fluids, 
monitoring his level of hypoxia. He's young, it's considered a mild case. So we would continue to monitor. If the person is going to get in trouble, do we know when they get in trouble? When he's severely hypoxic, can't breathe on his own. So right now it's looking like the second week, you know, the first week seems to be relatively stable in those individuals that don't present in an acute situation. And then the second week when they think they're, they might be getting better, you have to be concerned and watch for deterioration. So that's what the literature is showing. The fact that he's young, although we thought it would keep him from being hospitalized, we're now finding that that has changed a bit. So here are some learning objectives. We link you out to the CDC. We've uh, put in a little bit of background of doing a compare and contrast between China and the United States on how we're dealing with things to again, further educate you and additional references. But the cool thing is, is that when I close the case, hmm, I should have seen what I did. So I'm going to go back into my Let's see if I can get my case attempt. Doing this double software has been running into problems. So I'm not sure why it tossed us out of my system. But the cool thing is, is if you ever get tossed out in any of our cases, we save everything. Notice we never press the save button. We save everything every you know, half second. So with electrical outages and everything, we get to see what's going on. Here's what we just did. Here's my name, we played him, and I'm going to see my full report. What did we do here? This will be available for both you and the faculty. Huh, and it wiped it out. That's interesting. Um, you would be able to see it. So let me show you the type of thing that you can see. So for the faculty, they would be able to see what students had done what with an interactive pie chart. We would also be able to see, um, oops, sorry, pulled the wrong one up, individual case play. So if all of you were playing the case in classroom or outside of the classroom, we would be able to see how efficient and effective you are on getting your history, your physical exam and ordering of tests. If you were efficient, you would be down here in the green, and if not, you would be up in the pink. But the individual person, we would be able to see, and this is the report that I would have seen uh, if I had not had my computer, and it's on my side, guys. Um, my internet's been a little tweaky this morning, and I don't know why. So we would see what we did in the history. I would be able to see how I did versus the median of the class. And then if I delved into that history, I would be able to then see what my dialogue was. And that helps me do some self-reflection and see if I can make myself more effective in either choosing what I'm going to ask or choosing what I'm going to examine. So I'm going to open it up to questions for anybody, those that want to, you know, chat in some questions, um, or we can move to some slides. So while we're moving to some slides, why don't we open it up to anybody, any of the students here, any questions you might have? I did have one question. Um, if this is, if our professor or someone's joining us like you are um, at our school, and then do we all have a case open and we're all interacting on our computers together and then we can share our screens uh, so everyone can see or is it more so, you know, we're looking at one, uh, the professors or the, you know, the leading um, MD doctors, you know, screen and then we all just follow and listen. Um, you can do anything, you can do a number of different things. I could assign this all to you to play overnight in test mode. We could come back into small group sessions and do a case debrief where you would have to stand up and you know, actually give me an oral presentation of the case as if it were a real case in the clinic. Alternatively, I could have everybody go into the classroom, break into small groups and do a flipped classroom team-based approach to play through the case independently in the last 15 minutes, everybody would, you know, submit your case 
and then tell me what you think you have and not play it in learning mode, but again, play it in test mode so that we could see who got it right, who got it wrong and how they thought about it. I would be able to see all of your data immediately. I could play it in case review. You are superstars at information gathering and I'm going to play it in case review learning mode and you're getting ready to graduate and I want you to see a lot of different cases. So you get to look at the history and physical and then do all the diagnostic reasoning side because you've already shown me by the end of your clerkships, you were superstars in doing history and physical. So each case can be played in different ways. What I did wanna end with, if we can move on to the next slide, this was just a little slide summary. Um, perfect. See, my computer is just not a happy camper today. It's not letting me move forward. What I was gonna show you on the next slide was what do we know about the distribution between influenza and the coronavirus? And what we're seeing there is we lose something like 64,000 people per year from influenza. We're getting very excited because we've got like, oh, here it is. Um, and this was from Saturday. Um, we lose number of deaths, 34,200 in 2018. It's gonna be a little higher in, in 2019, 2020, it looks like. You can see the COVID deaths as of Saturday um, was only 2,000. And so sometimes people wonder, why are we so concerned about COVID? And the real reason is, is the death rate is 10 times that of the death rate we find in influenza. The second reason is that in influenza, we have what's called herd immunity, which we've immunized the vast majority of the population. Thus, we're not gonna have that rapid spread. So you can see if we had 35 million individuals that had COVID-19, this death rate would be hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, some of the thought is, is because that the binding of the virus is, has a 10 times greater affinity to your epithelial cells in the respiratory tract than the influenza. We also have a greater percentage of individuals that go on to severe and critical, and the severe are also on ventilators. Hence that big discussion that you hear on the news all the time about not having enough ventilators. We know that a percentage of those, if we can you know, keep them oxygenated, will survive. So that's part of the discussion. So with that piece of information, just to put a bow on for my medical students, I wanted to thank everybody for their attention, uh, for participating in this. I wish I could have gotten to a little bit more of the questions that were coming from the audience, uh, but um, hopefully you learned a little bit about uh, diagnosing and the challenges in diagnosing.